Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Oh, welcome this morning. So good to have everybody here today. And what a sweet, sweet spirit in the house this morning. Take your Bibles out. Turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Missed you all last week. I had a chance to preach at our Monks Corner campus. We had a great time up there. Understand uh, Pastor Strickland did a wonderful job bringing the word to you last week. Always does. And just heard great, great reports. Book of John. John's an incredible book, one of the Gospels. One of the thoughts of John, he's trying to set out to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so the whole thought leads to that of his, of his writing. There's four Gospels, and that's kind of the intent of him. He's the Son of God. And he's going to use this imagery of water. And he starts out in chapter 2. Now, right away, out of the gate, you're going to find out that Jesus Christ is greater than. And so in chapter 2, he goes to a wedding feast. And at the wedding feast, they have... They run out of wine. And so what Jesus does is he takes these ceremonial uh, jars of water. They're used to clean the feet. All about ceremony, all about cleanliness, all about those things that are going on. And he takes it and he turns it into wine. And what Jesus Christ is saying is, I am greater than all of your ceremonies. I'm greater than all your religion. I'm greater than all your feast. The greater one has come. And there's an interesting statement in John chapter 2. It's that the host of the house said, he has saved the best wine till last. How many know Jesus Christ is always the best wine? John chapter 4, you have this other imagery of water. And so he goes by a well, and he meets a lady by Sychar in Samaria, and they go to a well, and the well is Jacob's well. And the lady is there, and they're sharing together. And so the, this, uh, this woman's there, and he says, give me a drink of water. And Jesus Christ says, and, and, and she makes a statement. She says, the well we're at is Jacob's well. This is the well that Jacob drank from. This is holy water. This is a very revered site. It's a very special place. This is Jacob's well. And she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? And he says, if you knew the water I had to give you, you would never, ever thirst again. And indeed, Jesus Christ is greater than Jacob. Incredible imagery, once again, that John's building up to. Now we get to John chapter 5, and and John is going to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is greater than the healing waters of Bethesda. There were some pools there, and they believed healing took place there, but Jesus Christ is going to emphatically prove he is the healer. He's greater than Bethesda. Let's stand together and look at God's word together. John chapter 5 and verse number 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. And when the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes in ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come, that the healer has come. We thank you, God, that you are greater than and you can do anything exceedingly abundantly above we could ever ask or think or imagine that you are the great almighty son of God and we love you so much. And We thank you that you're here this morning and I pray, God, that you'll minister to special needs here today and anyone who is sick that before this service ends they will find the healer for their physical needs, for our emotional needs, for our spiritual needs, whatever it is, you're the divine healer and we thank you and we give you praise and glory for what you're going to do. In Jesus' mighty name we ask it, amen and amen. Turn to someone, tell them to go for the gold and then you may be seated. 
Jesus uh, comes to Jerusalem, and the Bible says it's feast time. And John doesn't tell us which feast it in. There, there's, there's three uh, pilgrimage feasts they had to return to Jerusalem for, and so all the Jews are coming back in, but it doesn't tell us which feast they're coming back for, one of those three feasts. And the Bible says he goes by way of the Sheep Gate. Very interesting right off the bat, Jesus Christ, what does John first say when he sees Jesus Christ? Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And now you have the one who's going to lay down his life for us. Now you have the one who is the sheep who's going to be our sacrifice for us, the sacrifice for the sins of the entire world, the perfect Lamb of God. What does he do? He walks through the sheep gate. This is the gate where they took all the ceremonial sheep that would be slaughtered at Passover and they would be killed at the Passover feast. They all went through this gate. They were maintained by the priest. There was a special priesthood who was assigned to wash the sheep outside the city of Jerusalem, possibly near Bethlehem, possibly where Jesus Christ, where the shepherds were on the hillside. They may have been watching ceremonial sheep when that angel came down and said, a, a child is going to be born. The name will be called Jesus. And so when, they're, when they're, they're bringing, they would bring the sheep through the sheep gate and take them on up to the temple area to be sacrificed. It's through there Jesus Christ walks. And he, and he passes a pool called Bethesda. Now, in the ancient world, there were healing shrines located all around the Middle East area. And they would find these places. And, and when the Jews settled there, they inhabited and took over many of these shrine areas. And, and often around those healing shrines would be pools of water for purification. And so before you could worship, there always had to be the purification ritual that would take place. And then you would worship. And so they had these shrines, these, and they believed this to be a very special, unique healing shrine. The, the, the pool had two twin pools that were side by side and, and around them were four porches and one porch went right down the middle of this pool of Bethesda. Yeah, there's a few pictures that were up behind me. That's what we saw when we were over there in the Middle East. That's what's left of it in Jerusalem today. The Jewish community in Jesus' day viewed this pool as a place of healing. Now the word Bethesda literally means house of mercy house of mercy, or another translation is flowing waters, because they believe that at certain times when the pool was being troubled or stirred up, that the healing angels were literally coming down, visiting that place, and the first ones who would get in the water would find their healing. Most likely there were underground springs that fed that pool in, in, in Bethesda. And so when those underground springs would bubble up, they thought the water was being troubled. Bam, if I can get there first, I can find my healing. And so Bethesda, house of mercy or flowing waters. Now what you see is an incredible contrast between man's hopelessness and God's mercy. And it really comes to light, and you have the irony of this place that is called the house of mercy, and yet around these pools are lying all those who, the Bible says, who are blind, who are lame, and who are paralyzed. Three groups of people, he says, are lying around these twin pools at Bethesda, waiting for the waters to be troubled, waiting somehow to get in. And so you have a house of mercy, but it is filled with sick folk, hurting humanity, Broken people, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, all waiting, all laying there, all waiting for some kind of stirring up the waters, these underground springs that would come and feed the pools. The sick and diseased are waiting and longing and searching for some kind of relief and some kind of comfort. You know, I, I think that's a, that's a picture of the sickness of humanity today. How long have we been waiting, waiting for medical technology to find a cure for cancer? We give money to cancer relief and cancer uh, exploration and somehow find and discover that cure and we search and we search and we search and up till this day there's still no cure that can be found for cancer and so we wait and we watch and see what's going to happen. We're looking for a cure for AIDS and there is no cure out there today and so we look for that cure. Looking for a cure for Alzheimer's. What a terrible uh, debilitating disease. It simply just uh, shrinks your mind up so there's nothing left up there. 
Alzheimer's and, and, and looking for a cure for MS or, or Lou Gehrig's disease or some other massive disease that's out there. And mankind is always searching, been looking for that proverbial stirring of the water. Somehow, if I can find something that will make me whole, that's what I'm looking for today. It's also a picture, I believe, of the nation of Israel. Israel now is under Roman domination. Rome is in control. There are soldiers walking up and down their streets. They are conscripted to carry the loads of the soldiers as they would walk by, and they could beat them at a moment's notice under a whim. They were under the oppression. There were heavy taxations. Sometimes some say up to 80 to 90% of everything they brought in was taxed for the Roman soldiers and Roman building projects. They're waiting for the promise. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 35. They're under this cruel yoke of oppression. Isaiah prophesied of a day that would come, a day that the healer would come into their midst. And I believe you begin to see the fulfillment of this at the pool of Bethesda. Look at verse number one. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands and steady steady the knees that give way. Say to those fearful in heart, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance and divine retribution and he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened. And the ears of the deaf unstopped. And the lame will leap leap like the deer. And the mute tongue will shout for joy. Waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, a thirsty ground, bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. Look at verse 10 if you would. And the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Listen, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this prophecy. The healer had come. No longer do they have to depend on a pool to bubble up. Now the bubbling waters has come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now springs in the desert have come to fruition because the Messiah has come. Salvation has come. The healer has come. Think it also as a picture of the hopelessness of our generation. Broken families, torn up by divorce, torn by heartache, Prodigal sons and daughters, an addicted society, incredible poverty all around, miserable, lonely, hurting people. Just like Jesus' day, multitudes pass by by the sheep gate and they keep flying by there and they go right by the gate and they go about their own business and no one stops and no one cares and we see the pictures and we think, my, how sad this must be, but we just keep right on flying by about our business every day. But into Bethesda, into that house of mercy, Jesus Christ walks in. And his eyes fall immediately to a man, the Bible says, who has been lame for 38 years. Lame. Unable to move, unable to walk. 38 years he's been in that condition. Probably of all those who are around the pool, he had been brought there the longest. 38 years he was there. Unable to move. Not only a prisoner of messed up legs, but a prisoner of despair. What chance did he ever have of being made whole, of being ever made well again? And yet day after day they brought them there in hopes that somehow the waters would be stirred, that there would be that magic solution, magic cure to all his problems. And then Jesus Christ looks at him and he asks him a question. As we hear this question, we think this just doesn't make any sense. And the question went like this, do you want to get well? Don't you see I'm here? Why are they carrying me here day after day after day if I didn't want to get well? Seems on the surface a very 
superfluous question. What, do, do you really want to be well? It seems unnecessary. Why was he brought to this pool every single day? But listen to me. He had been in that sad condition for so long, his will and his hope were as paralyzed as his legs. Given up all hope, will was gone, despair had set in, going through the motions again and again and again, day after day after day, never seeing any change and never believing any change was about to come or happen. All hope was gone. And when he asked him this question, instead of answering right off the gate, of course I want to be made well, he starts giving excuses or objections to why he's still lying there and why he is still in that condition. And there are two very real limitations, and I want to give them to you. The first one is simply this, no one, no one. I've got nobody to push me in the water. When the water is stirred up, no one, I'm the last one in. I, no one's there. His physical limitation is made worse by the isolation he feels. I have absolutely nobody who cares about me. I've been here for so long. You know, it's terrible to suffer. It's even worse to suffer all alone. And that's exactly where he finds himself. And, and I, I kind of look at this man, and I believe maybe in the early days his family would bring him and lay him by the pool, and I imagine his mama sat by him and watched him and took care of him and fed him and brought the food and did what she needed to do to take care of her son, but she probably has passed on and is no longer around anymore, and she's gone. I imagine there might have been some brothers and sisters who carried on the ritual of bringing them every day beside the pool, but they had things to do, and they had a life to lead, and they had their own family and their own kids, and they couldn't sit by the pool all day long just waiting for a troubling of the waters to take place, and so they would come, and they would drop them off in the morning and probably pick them up late at night and drag them back home. No one's left. The only people that he ever associates with are all the other infirmed and the weak and the, the lame and the blind who are gathered all around the pool, but for all intents and purposes, there's nobody there that will help him. But now he's given up all hope. The chance of getting the waters had left. No one really cares about me anymore. Don't you love it when the lights do that? Listen, if there's anybody that knows how to work computers, come see me, please, because we have tried for eight weeks to figure out how to stop it. At, what time is it today? 9.46. Okay. Every day, every Sunday, 9.46, bam, off it goes and on it goes. It's not a special effect. It's not designed. It just happens. Uh, we just love technology around Faith Assembly of God. I just thought I'd share that with you in case you were wondering, what's going on at this church no one. <laughs> now, I want you to notice, can you pick up a little bit on the self-pity? I've got nobody left. No one cares about me anymore. I'm all by myself. Nobody knows what I'm going through. My condition is the result of someone else's failure to help me. I'm still lame, because no one's around to help me. I'm all by myself. No one really cares about me. And this internal bitterness only compounds his misery and compounds his grief. Not only is he physically impaired, but now he is mentally and spiritually hopeless as well. Got nobody out there. Nobody really cares about me. You know, I think the first question we need to really ask, ask ourselves this morning is, do I really want to be well? I mean, we can like our sin, we can like our addiction, we can like our infirmity, we can like all the things we're complaining about and grumbling about and hanging on to, we can like our bitterness, and so that bitterness becomes our mat that we lie down on, and we camp there and we stay there and we blame everybody else for our circumstance. I'm like I am today because my mommy and daddy were dysfunctional or because somebody said something mean about me and that's why I'm like I'm, I am today. That's why I'm so angry and that's why I'm so bitter and I've got nobody else. We shift the blame instead of looking deep inside. Do you really want to be well? 
Do you want to be whole? Or do you love being miserable? The second limitation is similar to it. It's terrible timing. I'm too late. Not only is there no one, but it's too late. In fact, I'm always last. Last one in the pool. Last one in the water. There was an impossible circumstance that could not be overcome. Now, it, it appears from the text that almost you get the idea at Bethesda around these pools, it's kind of survival of the fittest, okay? And, and the strong are going to get stronger, and they're going to make it into the pool, and the weak are going to get weaker. It, it, it's like the, the first will succeed. Uh, only the early adopters will somehow get rich and make it. Everybody else is going to be left out in the end, and the weakest only get weaker, must have been quite a scene. that They're all around the water. The blind, of course, are waiting for someone to lead them into the water and make sure they make it to the right pool and don't land on the concrete. And there's the, the, the lame can't move, and so they need someone to push them, and the paralyzed, they're really in trouble. And so no one's moving, and yet there would be a few that could make their way into this water every time it got troubled. And I can imagine some are watching, and some are keeping a lookout, and those waters would start to bubble up a little bit, and someone would yell, surf's up! And the mad dash would ensue, and they would try to get there as fast as they could. And hope would rise in their hearts. They'd hear those words, the, the water's moving, it's troubling, now's the time, now's the time to move. And, and I'm sure hope would rise up in their hearts only to be dashed over and over and over again. You see, the first excuse is there is no one to help me. The second excuse goes something like this, everyone else is better than me. Now let's boil it down. Right? No one, I'm alone, I'm by myself. Excuse number two is everybody else around the pool is better than I am. They're stronger, they're fitter, they get into the water and I don't make it there. It is possible to bed down with our affliction for so long it actually becomes our friend. And we give up and embrace our sorrow and we hang on to our sorrow, and we're attached to our mat of addictions, we're attached to our mat of secret sins, uh, we're attached to our mat of self-pity and fear and depression and bitterness. And they become, we become psychological and spiritual invalids. So not only am I crippled physically, I become psychologically crippled as well. We draw inward and we complain and become negative, miserable people. We grumble and we gripe and we become more and more self-centered. And the real issue is if you were really healed, if you were really made well, you'd have nothing left to complain about. Nothing to talk about. And we've claimed, complained about our circumstances and our families and our job and our church for so long, all we know how to do is grumble and complain. And so I ask you again, do you want to be made well? Or do you like it like it is right now? Sometimes it seems like we've prayed for a long period of time, an extended period of time, and nothing seems to happen. I think the most frustrating thing for any child of God is to just pray. Somehow you believe God can do miracles. You believe he is the son of God. You put your faith in the Lord, but you pray and nothing happens. You pray the next week and nothing happens. And now you've prayed for a month and nothing's happening. And now you've prayed for six months. And now you've prayed for a year and nothing's going on and nothing's happening. And pretty soon we just stop praying altogether. And we don't believe our situation is ever going to change. Can you imagine praying for something 38 years and nothing happens? I want to give you two things. And I want you to jot these down at the bottom of your outlines right there. I want to give you two things that's going to help you in these times of the, the apparent silence of God. First of all, no, you don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. God can be working, God can be moving, God can be arranging situations, God can be putting things in place. God can be working on other men's hearts and women's. God can change the circumstances. God can move the course of men and women. God can be working all the time, but you don't always see in the natural what God is doing. And so it's in those times, 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so while in the natural you may not see anything happening or taking place, it does not move, mean that God is not moving. In fact, there is a promise to hang on to. I want you to get this. Uh, it says in Romans 8, all things, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who called according to his purposes. Uh, and so we know that even in difficulties, even in trials, uh, even in setbacks, God is still working. All things work together for good. Everybody say all things. work together for good. And the second thing I want to remind you of is keep praying in faith believing. Sometimes a challenge we face of repeated failure or disappointments and they come along and it occurs and it goes on and on and on, but don't give up believing because we have another all things promise and it goes like this, with God all things are possible. Say all things again, all things. So if, 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 you don't, if it doesn't appear God's not moving, I can trust his promise all things work together for good. But also I can believe for God to do all things because with God all things are possible. And so I will keep praying, I will keep believing, I will keep knocking, I will keep seeking and believe that the answer is going to come. Pray in faith, believing because all things are possible. Jesus Christ is absolutely the answer for every situation and problem in life. If you look for the right break, you'll be disappointed. If you wait for the perfect timing, if the waters would just move, if things would just line up just at the right place and the right time, if you're waiting for the right circumstance to come or the right break to happen in your life, it will leave you empty. If you're looking to someone else, maybe a new friend's going to solve my problem. Maybe it's going to be a new relationship. Maybe it's going to be a new wife, a new spouse, a new something else. Then I will be happy. That'll make me happy. I just find it in some other person. But you won't find it there. You will always be disappointed. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus Christ can give you a joyful, full, abundant life. You won't find it in this world. You won't find it in anyone else, anything else, any other circumstance. Only Jesus Christ can satisfy. He's the one who can make you whole, body, mind, soul, and spirit. Jesus saith unto him, rise. Take up your bed and walk. I love the way Jesus spoke to this guy. He, he didn't ask him then, hey, tell me how you got in this mess. Tell me what you did. Tell me how you blew it out there. He didn't ask him about his disappointments, his past failures, what, what he did wrong to get him in that situation. He didn't ask him how he got in that predicament. He didn't say, you should have known better. I, I was having a, an Olympic diving competition yesterday with my three grandkids and uh, we were in the pool and uh, we're diving in and I had to go for the gold. I had to go for the highest score possible. Jeannie was the judge and I was just so afraid she was going to kind of be swayed by the beautiful cuteness of her grandkids. And I, I'm trying to win the competition and so I had, came up with it that I'll do the dead man's dive. The dead man's dive is simply when you go like put your hands by your side and you just spring off the board and go head first without using your hands. And it's kind of a cool looking dive. The only trouble is I hit the bottom and I hit my head on the bottom and I busted my nose and blood's pouring out everywhere. And, uh, and I got a bad score to boot. So I didn't even win the gold. And uh, it was terrible. I was disqualified, DQ'd, out of the pool, out of the water. And he didn't say to this guy, what are you doing, dummy? You shouldn't have been diving head first into the water. That's why you're paralyzed today. He just simply says, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be healed? And then he makes this statement, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And at that point, when that healing word came, he had a choice. He could lie on his bed in self-pity and die alone 
or he could believe the word of God and act on it and rise and be healed in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Sometimes it's difficult when you're down and weak to believe God still loves you. I want to tell you, he does. He cares about you, and he's got a healing word for you this morning. And when the years have been hard and wasted, and it seems like time keeps rolling on and on, uh, when sin has left you crippled spiritually and emotionally, when you feel all alone and you're by yourself and no one really cares about you, when you are feeling very helpless in your situation, I want to tell you, this morning, you've heard the word of the Lord. You have heard from God's word, and I wanted to speak to your heart real loud and clear. I want to say to you this morning, rise and be healed. Jesus can come to you in whatever situation you're going through, and you can be made whole in him. You can rise a brand new person in the Lord Jesus Christ today. But first, you've got to, everybody's got to answer this question, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? Do you want to receive God's grace and mercy? Do you want to become a new person in Christ Jesus? Or do you want to remain in your sin, remain in your lifestyle, re- remain in your self-pity? The answer is yes, the Lord's here. Jesus Christ is the healer. He will heal your body. He's able to heal your body. Whatever sickness you may have, Jesus Christ can heal you today. He wants to heal you emotionally where you've been crippled emotionally, where you've been in pity and self-despair or bitterness or anger or whatever it is. He can heal you spiritually. He can break the power of addiction in your life. He can set you free from sin. He will make you a brand new person in Christ Jesus. He can take away any sin you've ever done. You just say, God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. And he will come in and he will forgive your sins. He will adopt you into his family and make you as one of his children. And then he can make you whole completely body, mind, soul, and spirit.